There were many people in the company who said, you guys are killing the place, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna go out of business tomorrow, you guys don't know what you're doing. And culturally, it was a true leap of faith. You know, we had no idea. Just, you know, to think that, you know, Red Hat would be where we are today, this successful, um, you know, that we'd be running greater than 20, on greater than 20% of servers in the enterprise, um, no idea. You know, in order to get there, you know, we sort of sort of started when I first started in my first day in Raleigh. I went to talk to the head of QE, and I said, "Oh, you just shipped a, a release." I said, "Certainly, um, uh, you can reproduce the release, and you know how to, you know, reproduce it bit for bit if we had to, etc." And he opened his desk drawer, and it was a bunch of CDs fell out, and he said, "I think we got it in here somewhere." And so Paul Cormier was brought in, and then he brought Brian Stevens and I in as like the enterprise guys. And so uh, Paul said, you know, just do what you guys did there, you know, bring some structure and organization here. You haven't been involved in Linux, you're from a proprietary company more or less, and you show up to this company that just believes in community developed software more than any other company in the world. And, and you have to lead them. We started in a spare bedroom at my house. That was the first presence of what's now the engineering headquarters here in Westford. You know, the, the first pass of it was actually building two teams. The first pass was taking the existing enterprise, the existing Red Hat team, and, and they became community-minded. And then I built another team um, organically from the first 10 people that we were able to afford, um, and they became the enterprise team. And I think that was sort of that tipping point, is when we st stopped trying to separate the two teams, and instead we started to put them together. We quickly came to the realization that in order to really distinguish ourselves with an enterprise release, we'd have to stop the current release, Red Hat Linux. We are pulling that out of retail with the belief that we could build a better model for consumption for enterprise, um, and we were scared to death. Linux was really just starting to get used in the enterprise for the first time, but it was really by the early adopters, and they really saw the power of the evolving x86 architecture and the community-led innovation from Linux that was really poised to take over the Unix marketplace. They wanted a stable platform that they could run their application on, that they could update as a platform and have the application work the same or better. And so it was really around the 2002 was what should that subscription model look like? Yeah, my initial perceptions were uh, from a technical perspective, I thought it was creative. Uh, from a business, I wasn't certain, uh, actually I thought it was crazy from a business perspective. Now looking back and participating as, a, as long as I have, it's, it was brilliant. It was represented different things for different people. For the engineering and development team, the real challenge we see in the subscription model is that you have to earn your customers' trust every day. It took me a little while to, to understand the process in the community, and uh, I, I came around, but my immediate impression was that you, you know, random collection of folks on the internet cannot build quality software, and I was completely wrong. I've been involved with Red Hat probably uh, 12 or 14 years now. I was a former uh, advisory board member uh, with Red Hat and was there at the inception of RHEL. You know, obviously there were choices um, other choices between the big iron vendors, but the flexibility that they provided and the nimbleness that they provided really wasn't comparable to what uh, Red Hat was able to come in and do. What we did was we started to work with them to get a life cycle that they wanted to have the, the software supported for longer periods of time. Its release model and release cycle allowed a nice compromise for uh, having releases in far enough out that it gave Red Hat an opportunity to deliver um, innovative features and working with the community to provide uh, functionality that enterprises needed, but also slow enough that uh, those enterprises could keep up. Customers would come to us and they'd say, I want to run you know, this hardware, I want to run this ISV software on top of it, and I want it all to work together. They wanted to all put their own isms into, the, into a Red Hat release and have us have a separate release for each of them. We knew that wouldn't scale. And so we had to push back on the biggest tech companies in the world. 
and it was really a David versus Goliath type of moment. And so we were these small guys, we were trying to take them on, and every day and every year it was like fighting for survival. So you had to, you had to have some pretty thick skin, and you really had to um, you know, listen to customers and really help try to drive those feature gaps. Uh, it was quickly clear that uh, Linux would be scalable across all of our computing segments, and it really opened up our ability to deliver Intel capabilities and technologies unencumbered. And that was really the power of RHEL, that it brought all those pieces together in one stable platform that customers could trust and depend on for their lifecycle deployments. Um, but I do have to say that, you know, of the, you know, the pioneers, really, the pioneer around um, really investing in, in Red Hat and Linux and really seeing the opportunity was Dell and Michael Dell. Ten years ago, Red Hat revolutionized the IT world by giving enterprise customers something that they really wanted, which was an OS alternative that was open source. They came to us and said, we're launching a new platform. We want you to be part of it. So Red Hat, Oracle, and Dell launched a new platform. And Oracle at the time had to rely on Windows, Microsoft, and or the Unixes for their database. And then they invited our CEO at the time, uh, myself and, and Matthew Zulik, to go to their launch. Matthew on stage with Larry Ellison, and Larry saying, this is how great Red Hat is, and we're going to build our platform on, on Red Hat. We believe that open, standards-based technology is truly IT at its best, empowering customers to get more value from their technology and better outcomes for their users. We evolved how we were doing our models, and so a lot of these community people who really challenged our assumptions, they really helped us grow stronger and get a better product from it. You know, ever since we started, we were working on hardening the kernel, providing drivers, delivering IA technologies, all through Red Hat Enterprise Linux. As well as one of the things I'm very proud of is the work on carry grade Linux. By delivering the Intel platforms with carry grade Linux, we were able to shift an entire industry. The telco industry shifted to an open platform delivered by uh, Red Hat. We knew that if we made a carrier-grade Linux separate distribution, it would always be an orphan just for the telco industry. We had a vision to make one Linux and over time make that one Linux encompassing of the entire, of everything that was needed. And open source is really largely this glue that is bringing all this technology together, all connected to your smartphone. So in our view, open source software is the fundamental enabler to IBM's vision of a smarter planet. Virtually every, every enterprise workload in the world runs on an IBM Red Hat combination somewhere. And I remember at the time, the industry wanted to add a virtualization to Linux. And it was the first time that we, um, there really was an open source hypervisor. Um, and instead of trying to build a discrete revenue stream on virtualization, we instead decided the hypervisor belonged with the OS. Um, and so, you know, Zen was our debut for um, virtualization and that became part of RHEL 5. And then along comes, you know, this one engineer, Avi Kaviti, in 2007 and sends a one a very small patch set up to a uh, Linux kernel mailing list that basically turned the Linux kernel itself into a hypervisor. There were people everywhere around in and outside of Red Hat that were saying you can't do this. Zen is established, you're going to buck the trend. How can we stand alone? Our engineers were confident enough to know that they had the, they had the skill set to make KVM the better technology over time. And I'll stand behind these guys any time. And ever since then, the world has changed for open source virtualization for our customers and for Red Hat with the inception of what is now known as KVM. So it's really Red Hat's job to bridge the gap between that developer and the enterprise to help deliver quality software while also adding um, uh, value add on top of that. The, the interesting thing is that we brought these technologies that weren't completely open source up front and we followed our same tried and true principles of open sourcing the technology and really growing the value of that. In 2008 we started this, let's use our products, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, let's use JBoss Enterprise uh, application server and actually build a customer portal. I know Red Hat was one of the first to provide uh, online portal access to the support queue, uh, providing your dedicated uh, account management support and uh, TAM support uh, for us. 
uh, and really that true engagement that we saw uh, from Red Hat and wanting to make sure that we were happy and that our needs were being met. And that's how we could connect to these customers, really listen as well what they wanted and actually we adopted it in the product but also in the support delivery. We sort of had this vision that we wanted the entire stack to be open source stack at some point. We, used, we called it the open source architecture. We were on the board trying to write what the architecture used to look like, was going to look like in the future, etc. So early adoption in key areas like what's known as LAMP stacks and web serving and uh, early IT infrastructure around networking and so forth were early workloads that Red Hat Enterprise Linux started to serve and it started to create a presence in what was otherwise a proprietary data center environment. We're the only uh, Linux vendor who completely preserves compatibility across all of our update releases and all of our maintenance streams. You know, these guys have, have made technical achievements in here uh, that just normal guys couldn't do. And it's pretty telling when the National Security Agency calls you in and we send a handful of the best and the best down there and now they're all running route. The 10 year um, investment around security that you know originally you know was pioneered by the NSA but now it has broad based applicability in terms of the impact it makes on customer environments because SD Linux in the cloud is one of the most relevant pieces of technology probably running on Amazon today. Well, if something better came along, we might explore it, but we don't know of anything better in terms of setting open standards, building broad collaboration, and working together than open source. The innovation in a community-based environment, together with our partners, is still core and fundamental to how we build the, the Linux operating system. And so I think that you know what that set us up for the next 10 years is is it's not about Linux anymore. It's not about the operating system anymore. It's about um, enterprise IT. And enterprise IT doesn't just run an operating system. The future is, is cloud technology and virtualization and messaging and middleware and platforms of service and storage and unstructured data. And so same challenge 10 years ago is really what sets us apart today. And it's really this combination of the best of community-led innovation with the best of stability and enterprise-level life cycles. As the industry changes and evolves, Intel and Red Hat will continue to innovate and deliver solutions that enable our customers to meet the challenges that they see in the future. I look forward to helping advance and innovate together with Red Hat and deliver choice, choice in key areas of computing, including open virtualization, cloud, and big data. The other Linux players really weren't able to and didn't have the credibility uh, and even the forethought to really make that leap and make that jump uh, and expend the effort and the time and the money to build a platform that could provide the stability to the enterprise but also leverage the community um, for all that it has uh, to deliver a rock solid product. The thing that's really cool about being part of this team is it's not just this job you're doing, you're not just adding the next feature. There's this feeling like you're, you're on this crusade, you know, there's this mission element about it. To feel that we've made this impact um, that's, that's way bigger than who we are has been incredible. We have over 2.5 million uh, subscriptions out there for RHEL, so that, that's great, but the other dimensions are is we're bringing the world to fundamentally different places. That's where, that's where we're going in the future. RHEL's taken us in the future with what we called back then the open source architecture, with what the industry calls now cloud computing. It's never boring, it's never a dull moment, and it's like we're never done because we can always see around the corner that there's just so much better we can get, there's so much more uh, that we can do with our customers. We're really straddling both worlds in that we solved a lot of problems that customers have had in the past and today, and we're driving the future.